Thank you for allowing me to serve you. I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Today, I will be speaking about how to be holy in body, heart, and in conduct. This holy command and calling of ours comes straight from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and the Omega, Jesus Christ. Now let's begin in Jesus' name. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Before the cross, Jesus did not have an impressive form or majesty that, people got, that got people's attention. He had no appearance that anyone should desire him. After the cross, Jesus was hard to look at because he was beaten so bad that he did not look like a man. His bodily form did not look like a human being. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like, some, uh, like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we did not value him. Yet he bore our sicknesses and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. He was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. The punishment of our peace was on him. We are healed by his wounds. We are all like sheep that have gone astray. We will all have turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep silent before her shears. He did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment and who considered his fate. For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of people's rebellion. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with the rich man at his death. Because he had done no violence and had spoken no uh, deceit. Yet the Lord pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed. He will prolong his days by his hands the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. After his anguish, he will see the light and be satisfied. By the knowledge of his servant, he will justify many. He will carry their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him the mighty spoil because he willingly submitted to death. He was counted among the rebels, yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. Isaiah 53. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but deliver us from the evil one. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. In Jesus Christ's mighty name, amen. The title of the sermon is called what is holy? After Jesus demolished the Egyptian gods and made a mockery out of them and Pharaoh, Jesus led the famous Exodus by leading the children of Israel out of captivity. The 10 plagues that Moses performed were not just plagues. Each plague represent an Egyptian god. The first plague was turning the Nile to blood. It was the judgment against Apis, the god of the Nile. Isis, or Isis, the goddess of the Nile, 
and Kunam, the guardian of the Nile. Now the second plague was judgment against Heket, goddess of birth. The third plague was Nats against Seth, the god of the desert. The fourth plague was flies, judgment against Uachit, the fly god. The fifth plague was death of livestock, judgment against the goddess of Hathor. The sixth plague was boils, judgment against three gods, the god of health, disease, um, and Sekhmet, the sun new and the Isis god. The seventh plague was hail and fire that attacked Nut, the sky goddess, Osiris, the crop fertility god, and Seth, the storm god. The eighth plague was locust that went against Nut, Osiris, and the Seth gods. The ninth plague was darkness that went against the sun god, Re. And finally, the tenth plague that was death on all the firstborn males. It was judgment on the God of Isis, the protector of the children. Exodus 12, 12, even though it is a true story, preachers and teachers use Egypt as a metaphor, as a representation of slavery and the world, or both. Now, after the Exodus, Jesus wanted the children of Israel to be holy in every respect. The word holy is used over 600 times in the entire Bible. Holy in Hebrew is kodesh, which means set apart for a specific purpose, a sacred thing or thing, consecrated, dedicated. Holy in Greek is hagios, that means physically pure, morally blameless, or religious ceremonial, ceremonially consecrated. First of all, set apart for honorable use. To live a holy life means that Christians live a life that is set apart, reserved to give God glory. It is a life of discipline, focus, and attention to matters of right living. In other words, Jesus pulled you out of the world. He broke your chains of slavery to sin. He pulled you out of the muddy pit. He saved you from physical and spiritual shield. Jesus picked you up, separated you, cleaned you, polished you up, and equipped you so that you would be a vessel used for his purpose to do good works before the foundations of the earth were formed. So that he gets all the glory, but you reap all the benefits. Psalms 103, 2. That's all holy means. Because he did this, you act accordingly in body, heart, and in conduct. For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Leviticus 11:45. You shall be holy to me, for I am the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. Leviticus 20, 26. We were once Gentiles. We were orphans. We were once alienated from God. But now we have been reconciled. Uh, he has reconciled us through Christ, through his physical bodily death, to present us holy in his sight without blemish and free from uh, accusations. Colossians 1.22. You see, it doesn't matter if it was in the Old Testament found in the book of Leviticus chapters 19 and 20 or in the New Testament. Jesus wanted his people uh, to be holy like him. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His character does not change. Now in a large house, there are only vessels uh, uh, of objects of gold and silver, but also vessels and objects of wood and of earthenware some for honorable, noble use, for good use, some for dishonorable, ignoble, and common use. Godly and worldly people do this with material, uh, material things. For example, some people uh, have a china dish set that they set apart only, uh, that they only bring out for certain occasions. Or they have a car that they uh, drive uh, on the weekends only. Church clothes, for example, that's only used on Sundays. The list can go on and on. Then we have things like plungers, that we use to unclog the toilets, that we put behind the toilet or in the blind spot, uh, blind spot in the bathroom. Jesus does the same thing uh, with people. The only difference is, is that he sets people apart. Now in the book of uh, Jeremiah 18, four and six, the Bible says the vessels that he was making from the clay were spoiled by the potter's hand so that he would make it over again, reworking it and making it into another pot. And, and it seemed good to him. 
Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you what this potter does? Says the Lord, look carefully as the clay is in the potter's hands, so are you in my hands. People are made from the dust of the earth, for dust we are and dust we shall return. Pharaoh was raised up as an instrument of dishonor, while Moses was raised up as a vessel of honor. Now, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 21, those who have cleansed themselves from the latter, meaning from their old ways, will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work, you are not only Jesus' temple, but, his, but this, this temple of ours is offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 2.5. Now, these spiritual sacrifices of ours is denying our fleshly impulses by taking up our cross daily and dying to self, and also by offering uh, sacrifices of praise. Keep in mind, the spirit of glory that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. And if anyone destroys Jesus' temple, Jesus will destroy him. For Jesus' temple is holy. You are that temple. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. It is so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful, marvelous light. 1 Peter 2, 9. The old man was a vessel of dishonor. But because of the blood of Christ, you now are a vessel of honor. Your body is set apart and is the temple of the, of the living Jesus to be used to help the body of Christ and to use your members as servants of righteousness, all to the glory of Jesus Christ. Your body is holy and it is to be used in a holy fashion. Now let's talk about how to be holy in heart. Father God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, Galatians 4, 6. We are to set apart Christ as Lord in our hearts, 1 Peter 3.15. Your heart consists of your mind, will, and emotions. Your mind is where intellect, reasoning, understanding, conscience, and the thought process comes, uh, comes from. This is what Jesus sees. This is one of the many reasons why we are to renew our minds, meditate on the Holy Bible, and turn them into the minds of Christ. The human will is used to express desire, choice, willingness, and consent. In other words, not only, will, uh, not only but your will, not only your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not just my will, but your will. Uh, last uh, of the heart is emotions. Not sinful emotions, but godly emotions. Don't confuse the old man's heart with the new man. The old man's heart was deceitful above all things and desperately sick, Jeremiah 17, 9. But that was before Christ. You no longer have that kind of heart. You no longer have the heart of stone. Now you have the heart of flesh. You now have the mind of Christ. You can still lie. You can, you can steal. You can cheat. But your conscience, it will bother you. And the Holy Spirit will be grieved to the point to where you will stop because you won't have peace until you do. But the way you put Christ as Lord of your heart is by putting him above your understanding. When you don't understand things, put Christ above your reasoning. When, you don't, uh, when things don't make sense, put Christ above your will. Not my will, but your will be done. You put Christ above your emotions, the things that you care about. Christ is the first place in every area of our, of our life, soul, and body. We talked about the body and we talked about the heart. Now let's, let's talk about the conduct. Now, the Amplified Bible says in 1 Peter 1.15, like the Holy One who called you to be holy yourself in all your conduct, set apart from the world by your godly character and moral courage. Conduct means the manner in which a person behaves. Christians are to walk different, talk different, think different. They're supposed to move different. You're supposed to stand out and bring attention to yourself by the way you move. That's how Christ gets the glory, because you, in turn, give, uh, give uh, Christ the glory. 
Christians are to walk with their heads high, but they're with their hearts low. Not to be conceited, 1 Corinthians 13, of what 1 Corinthians 13 speaks about, how love is not conceited. But we are to keep into remembrance what Christ pulled us out from. Christ is the one who saved us and called us. He called us to a holy calling, a holy office with holy gifts, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and pleasure, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, 2 Timothy 1.9. God, the Holy Spirit, is the one who works and is leading us to sanctify us and make us more Christ-like. Holiness is not the way to Jesus. Jesus is the way to holiness. In fact, the way a person can keep the way pure is by keeping a watch on himself according to your word, conforming his life to Jesus' way as a governor to keep a person in check. That's Psalms 119.9. Uh, now, when gov a governor in this context is talking about like a, car, a car's engine, a governor uh, is not allowing it to go past a certain uh, mile per hour. Jesus is the truth. And his truth is sanctifying us in the truth. The Bible is truth. In fact, the Holy Spirit goes further and says that we uh, are to perfect holiness in the fear of Jesus. Perfecting uh, holiness is talking about complete, accomplish, to fulfill further, execute, by implication, to uh, terminate. In other words, you, uh, you live a life set apart for Jesus' purpose out of respect and fear. Because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if you defile Jesus' uh, temple, Jesus will destroy you. 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 17. Jesus barely spared Moses. What do you think he would do to you? Exodus 4, 24. Now, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. For example, in 1 Corinthians 5. The Corinthian church had church members that were committing sexual immorality. A man was sleeping with his father's wife. Paul said that, that man should be given over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of salvation. The Amplified Bible goes even further and says in 1 Corinthians 6.18, to run away from sexual immorality in, in any form, whether it's in thought or behavior, whether it's visual or written. Every other sin that a man commits, it's outside the body. But the one who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. People can be handed over to Satan for different reasons. This man for sexual immorality, and Job was handed over uh, for another reason. In either case, the end result is to produce a harvest of righteousness and peace for the good of that person. However, Jesus can be gentle. The Bible says that he won't break a bruised reed or put out a smoldering wick. In other words, some people just might need a good kick in the butt to get them to straighten out, while others just might need rest. One size doesn't fit all in the kingdom of God. Father God deals with his children individually and specifically. He knows what we need. One person might need a hard rebuke, while others will get a soft rebuke. Father God knows how to bring a child home or straighten them out. You have to understand that Jesus' ways and thoughts are not like our thoughts. And they're not like our ways. If Father God doesn't deal with you, then you are illegitimate. The way we perfect holiness is by purifying our lives by one of two ways. A stop cold turkey approach to where we remove people such as family and friends by removing things and bad habits out of our lives. We stop walking in lies. We don't use a foul or abusive language. We get rid of bitterness rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Don't get drunk with wine. Another way is a progressive sanctification. It is when you start subtracting, subtracting things in your life little by little. In either case, it is a life that contradicts and doesn't parallel whose interests are not aligned with the teachings of Christ or Christ himself. This is what the Bible calls perfecting holiness. You go from baby to young uh, to finally a godly uh, man or woman. Instead, we are to be uh, kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you and live a life that doesn't grieve the Holy Spirit. By doing this, you prove two things. One, by the way that you live, 
You have repented of your sins and have turned to God. Luke 3.8. And second, I will show holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations. The name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I have proved holy through you before their eyes. Ezekiel 36, 23. In other words, Jesus will put what he has done in a person's life on display in front of everybody to see so that they give glory to Jesus, so that they, so that they are without excuse. And if they refuse to give Jesus glory, then eventually he will rebuke their unbelief and hardness of heart just like he did to his disciples. Mark 16, 14. The Bible goes even further and says, not to be unequally yoked, unequally bound together with unbelievers. Do not make mismatched alliances with them, inconsistent with your faith. For what partnership can righteousness have with lawlessness? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Jesus does not want us to be unequally yoked with unbelievers for four reasons. One, Jesus is holy, so we are to be imitators of Christ. Two, it is a holy command. Be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. He who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God, who gives us his Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 and 8. Number three, he wants godly offspring. Malachi 2.15 and number four, evil company corrupt good habits. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 33. Okay, let's recap. We talked about how to be holy in body, how to be holy in heart, and how to be uh, and in conduct. Now let's talk about what would happen if we are not holy in these areas. Now in the book of, uh, um, in the book of uh, Hebrews, chapter 12, 14, the Bible states that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Doubting Thomas I'm not talking about Donnie Thomas. Donnie Thomas is talking about the natural man. He was convicted by his five senses, not his heart. John 20, 25. Hebrews is talking about sp the spiritual man. There are nine ways a child of God can see the Lord. A child of God can see uh, Jesus through trials, signs, wonders, war, by a strong hand, by an outstretched arm, by great terrors. Deuteronomy 4, 34 through 39. In fact, rays are flashing from his hand. This is where his power is hidden. Habakkuk 3, 4. The eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth to show himself strong for those who wholeheartedly are devoted to him. 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 69. When you pursue peace with all men and live a holy life, Hebrews 12, 14. If you have a pure heart, Matthew 5, 8, through divine revelations of the scriptures, Luke 24, 45, when he comes back as a thief in the night to pick us up, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, through dreams and visions. Now, a vision is when you are awake and you see what Jesus is going to uh, do to you, through you, for you, to give an illustration, to tell the future, uh, to tell future uh, events, Acts chapter 10, 9 through 16. It's when your imagination goes into a daydream while you are awake, while you are awake in a trance. That's the difference between a, a regular daydream and a godly daydream, is the trance. Now, a daydream is a blank stare, while a vision is a fixed stare. In closing, growth and separation in the life of a Christian go hand in hand, just like peanut butter and jelly. To, uh, you, uh, you do this out of respect and fear of the Lord. Christians should not be of the world, nor be contaminated of the world and its lust. Instead, Christians should be separated from the world and not be conceited or stuck up, but humble because we were once in their shoes. Christians are only pilgrims here. We are not to set up roots here. This is only a pit stop for Christians. We are not to store up treasures here on earth, but store up treasures in heaven, in the upper room, our mansions where we will be with Father God forever. Just because we are in the world doesn't mean that, that we are of it. The earth and everything in it will rust, the glory will fade, eventually will come to an end. Besides, we brought nothing into the world and we will take nothing out. 1 Timothy 6, 7. 
Now, if Christians want to leave an inheritance to the kids, or if they want to leave a last will and testament to be given, uh, a last will and testament to be given to a nonprofit organization, by all means, knock yourself out. All I'm saying is that the only thing that we could take with us when we die is our beliefs, convictions, and the spiritual things that we have done in our human tents. All in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, we should go out, spread the message, help the orphans, widows, and the poor. We should follow Jesus' example. We stop by to plant and water, and then we move on uh, to the next and spread the fragrance of Jesus Christ wherever we go. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Psalms 1. In other words, fortunate, prosperous, and favored by Jesus is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, following their advice and example nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits down to rest in the seats of the ridiculers. The wisdom you should be getting should be from Jesus, the Bible, and Christians. You see, Jesus' wisdom is double-sided, meaning his wisdom just keeps unfolding and unfolding and goes on forever like that. That's found in Job 11.6. In fact, Jesus has a monopoly on wisdom. Job 15.9. For example, the cross is one form of wisdom. Solomon and the book of Proverbs is another form of wisdom. The wisdom from above is pure and undefiled. Do not follow someone who will lead you on a destructive path and don't sit with people who will make fun of you because of what you believe in. Yes, you should tell them about Christ. In fact, you should have the same mentality as Christ did. For Christ did not come uh, for the righteous, but the sinner. Christ did not come for the healthy, but he came for the sick. But eventually you should move on. All we do is plant, pray, water, and move on. The rest we leave in Jesus' hands. The hard reality is that some people, uh, some people's name will be blotted out from the Lamb's book of life because of their unbelief. Now, sanctification is just like walking in the Spirit. It should be a natural process. You will want to be holy. Now, if you'd like to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, just pray a simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. I would believe you were born of a virgin. I believe you came in the flesh. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you were raised from the dead on the third day um, and that you are now sitting at the right hand of God. I receive, I believe and I receive this free gift. Come into my heart and life and be Lord of both. Also, I ask that you give me the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Now, if you prayed that simple prayer, you are born again. Find a church that matches the gospel and the Bible. And if you haven't already, go get baptized. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God and the eternal gospel, born of a virgin by the name of Mary, stepped out of glory, wrapped himself in flesh, died on the cross for sinners like you and me, was raised from the dead on the third day, stepped back into glory, who now sits at the right hand of God, the true power. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus is coming back. You can bank on that. In Jesus' name. Worthy.